Well, hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Unlock Show. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson. This is the place that you will learn all things to do with online business and how to run a really successful one. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking with the amazing Nathan Stuck, who's going to be talking to us about how the heck do we build a business that's actually a force for good. So we always want to do that, of course, right? So you guys want to make sure that we those of you that are watching the Unlock Show, you guys are all really good people. We want to be doing the right thing. And if we can, being able to do some really good stuff for our local community, but also, you know, globally too. So I've asked Nathan to be on today's show because I know that he, with his experience and his wisdom and being award, an award-winning leader in the B Corp community, and in addition to his role as a Director of Corporate Culture and Strategic Impact at Victorism uh, Solution, which is a, a certified B Corp, and he's also funded and runs a local uh, B business in uh, Georgia. We've just been having a great old conversation behind the scenes about football. So you're probably going to see on the screen right now behind Nathan, you know, a whole lot of football paraphernalia, huge uh, football fan. So we've just, um, he's in a bit of commiserations this week because his team didn't do so fantastic. So, um, you know, being on the Unlock show is going to be the highlight highlight of his week. It's kind of cool to be able to say, hey, I'm the highlight of somebody's week um, after they've had such a bad one. So welcome to the show, Nathan. It's fantastic to have you here. And I can't wait to really talk um, talk about, you know, how can we start creating our businesses to be a real force for good? How do we actually do that? And we'll even dive into, you know, what the heck does it even mean to be a B Corp? And what sort of things do you do in the community? And why are these, why is it so important that we move forward in this manner, particularly with some of the stuff that's going on in, um, you know, in the world these days? So welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thanks, Tracy. Excited to be here. Always excited to talk purpose. And, I'm, and I don't shy away from purpose and profit. Um, they go hand in hand. So I'm um, always happy to talk about it. Fantastic. Well, look, I totally agree. You know, when you you start out in business and you're super, super passionate about it and you've got a real purpose, you know, you can't really hang around for too much to, for very long if you can't turn that into a profit. So I think that is super important that, um, you know, you, you've established that right from the get go. So let's talk a little bit about your background and your history. Tell us a little bit about you. How have you come to be doing what you're doing now? Um, you know, and, and what's led you to this? How have you become so passionate about this uh, This particular cause being a force for good oh uh, it's funny i'm actually i'm actually working with a, a friend of mine writing a book right now about my like just my journey to, to mm-hmm. finding a career that i get excited to get out of bed in the morning um so uh so it's a, it's a great question it's a loaded question um yeah i mean honestly it was a bunch of jobs i i, I feel like that most most people you know like one of those is my undergraduate degree i'm not sure which one um but you know i just kind of graduated you go to college because you're supposed to go to college um graduate and then you just i knew i wanted to do business and i got a job in business and i was honest i was dispatching trucks like exciting stuff um never what i thought thought never what i thought i would be doing and just kind of just never really i don't know i there was nothing that I moved. I moved to Las Vegas. Like you kept trying to like chase happiness, you know? So I was in my twenties mm-hmm. in Vegas for five years. I worked for enterprise rent a car. I did outside sales, which honestly was the best move I've ever made. Even though I'm not a good salesperson, um, the skills you pick up are you're, you're selling everything you do in life. You are selling in some form or another. So I did that. I moved back to Athens and then I ended up going to get an MBA and, um, and of course, you know, the full time MBA, you, a lot of your classmates are 24, 25, and this is part of their plan. They'll work, for, you know, and I was just kind of like, I don't know, I'm resetting. So <laughs> I just, I knew at this point, I knew what I didn't want to do. And this was 2015. So, um, you know, you go through those core classes, and there was a, an email that went out, and this company wanted to certify as a B Corp. I was in the Net Impact Club. So, like, it went to us, and I was like, sound cool. So I went to that first meeting and, <clears throat> excuse me, I met our first, my now CEO, my boss, um, Jeff and his wife. And they were like, they had eight employees. They didn't have an office and they're going to certify. They want to certify as a B Corp. And I'm like, first of all, my boss has like this like ponytail, his shirt's buttoned mm-hmm. to like here. And you're like, this guy owns a business, you know, like <laughs> who is this guy? And then um, what's a B Corp? I had no idea, but it just seemed there was something about him. 
and his wife that just seemed really cool and charismatic and something about the project that seemed like it would provide me something of maybe what I was what I was looking for. So I worked on it. The semester ended. It was for zero class credit. I worked on it for a semester. In the end of the semester, I told Jeff, I'm like, do you want to keep going with this? Like we didn't get that far. And so I ended up working on it for the, my last two semesters after my internship. And about halfway through those last two semesters, he was like, what are you doing when you graduate? So at this point, we had 20 employees, you know, and we had um, I think we had just signed a lease. We had an office that we were going to move into. And so I accepted that offer and that role just kind of. I don't want to say I created it, but I was I was so passionate about once I got into the B Corp and when I was, you know, going through the assessment and helping quantify things. And we need to put this new process in. we need to put this policy in the handbook. I just fell in love with this work. And I honestly was doing director of operations when I came in. That was my background. That's what they needed. Most 20 employee companies can't afford a director of culture and strategic impact. And as we've grown you know, over the years to 35 to 60 to 85, and now we're like, I think 136, I think is the exact number. Like I, this is a full-time role. And I kind of, I tr we hired somebody, we, we saw it, we hired somebody, trained them to do the operations piece. And um, I just get to be a student of this world of how to create engaging jobs, how to make an impact in the community and how to really be that, we call them beekeepers, but that, that keeper of all things purpose-driven. Mm -hmm. So I know every number, I know retention by demographics. I know everything in our company. So mm -hmm. yeah, long, long kind of journey to it, but I found it. That's fantastic. And, you know, like you say, often we go through, you know, life kind of dabbling in a few different things. We, 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 we start out, we think, okay, well, I'm going to have to go to college. I'm going to have to get a, you know, a, a degree of some sort and then fall into a job thinking that that's where you're going to stay for some time and then realize that, mm, hang on a minute, this is not quite what I want to do. And off you went on another path. So congratulations to you for kind of identifying that and then jumping full in to do your MBA and, and be like, okay, well, I'm going to be in this in this classroom with a whole bunch of, you know, young bucks um, who are probably looking at me thinking, what the heck's this guy doing here? Um, but, you know, and then moving forward with that. And that's a fantastic growth in the company that you're in right now. So congratulations for that too. Look, for, for the those that are not familiar with this terminology, because, um, you know, B Corp, what, what exactly is it? And and why why should, particularly, you know, those that are watching the Unlock show right now are predominantly, you know, smaller based businesses, maybe they're even startups, you know, people that have got a lot of skill, knowledge, they've come out of the corporate space and are now um, immersing themselves into the online world. How does that sort of, what is a B Corp and how does it fit in to, um, into the online world? Yeah, so B Corps are for-profit businesses and the B stands for benefit. Hence the little, my little, oh, I keep getting confused with the way the camera, <laughs> pointing to the mm -hmm. wrong shoulder. Um, but the, uh, hence my little B Corp button. But it, yeah, it start, stands for benefit. It was started by three uh, gentlemen out that had started a company in America called and one. It was a basketball apparel company. Mm -hmm. And when, yes. they, and, and when, and, and I remember it, I'm a child of the nineties. So like when I, when they exited, I remember it. Yeah. I was like all the mixtapes. I mean, they were great. And apparently I didn't know this at the time I was, you know, a teenager in the nineties, but I didn't realize how well they treated their employees and that they had factories overseas and they were paying, they were paying American living wages and they had nothing in there though. The standard corporate, governance has always been shareholder primacy. Milton mm -hmm. Friedman, you know, businesses exist to create value for their shareholders. They're in the business of doing business. And, and when, so when they eventually sold, they didn't really have anything to protect them. So they didn't have any, they didn't have any legal protections against like, you know, I mean, you get to a certain point where you legally aren't allowed to say, but what about our employees? But what about our community initiatives? But what about our, you know, our, the, the impact that we've been able to make, you know, like, is this company that's buying us going to care, going to carry on any of that work? You can't even talk about that. It's just, does it create the most value for our shareholders? And so they watched their baby kind of get ripped apart overnight and they kind of decided we need to start something that helps entrepreneurs kind of protect their legacy. Um, not that necessarily every company is going to scale and sell, but a lot of them will. Mm -hmm. So they created B Lab, which is a nonprofit. And there's mm -hmm. a now there's offices um, all over the world. But they started B Lab US and Canada, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, basically, they are the nonprofit that oversees the certification. 
So when companies go through the assessment, there's an actual assessment that you have to take. There's five sections. There's corporate governance, there's community, there's workers, there's environment, and then there's customers. So, you know, everything from like customer section, everything from what do you disclose? How do you share data? What do you use data for? You know, emails and things like that to do you have a customer guarantee? Do you have a customer success? Do you have, um, you know, in the worker section, we'll have things like, you know, what's the pay multiplier from top to bottom? What's the, uh, what benefits do you offer? What benefits do you offer part-time employees? What benefits do you offer full-time employees? And then governance has, you know, have transparency, you know, obviously environmental has environmental uh, questions about, you know, you know, and a lot of it's around goal setting. It's around quantifying your numbers. It's about understanding your current state and where you are um, and where you want to go. And so it's, it's a very interesting, um, complex, all inclusive kind of like scorecard on your business. Mm -hmm. And once you submit, then you go through an audit. So you go through an audit process and then they, somebody from B lab, they have, you know, audit standards analysts is what they're called. And they go through and go through like question by question or like, kind of like prove it, prove it, prove it. And then every three years you have to actually recertify. So you can't just like certify and then like start like turn the sludge uh, <laughs> lever again and start dumping into the dumping into the waterway. Like you have to continue to do, which is a lot of my role is making sure that we don't wake up. We just recertified this year. We don't wake up in 2024 and go. We forgot to do it all. Like we forgot yeah. about the impact. part. I'm the one that's kind of like the whisper in the ear of, hey, here's where our numbers are. Hey, here's our current demographics. Hey, here's this cool initiative we could get involved with. So, I mean, and then I guess the, the 10 word answer is, is B Corp's art of businesses. What lead is to a building or certified organic is to milk um, mm -hmm. is basically the, the premise. Well, I love that, you know, that whole holistic approach to it and, and not just looking at things from, you know, a one, um, you know, a one point of view, which is that shareholder uh, profit standpoint, you're actually looking at the whole of business and every component and every stakeholder within that business and how can you actually be beneficial to everybody so that, you know, everybody wins. That old analogy of, you know, you, you lifting all boats together, so, you, you know, so I love that. And I think it's, it sounds to me like that whole system is very much built around um, intention and integrity because you're starting out with a very specific intention, which is to do good for everybody. And then the, the, uh, the integrity side of things is the fact that you've got to recertify on a regular basis. And I think that's kind of cool because it means that, you know, like you say, you can't kind of get certified one day and say, well, I'm certified organic, but now all of a sudden I'm putting a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, preservatives and pesticides and all sorts of other things into, uh, into my business and then find that, well, you know, once, once we were organic, we still say we're organic, but we're actually not really truly doing all of the things that we should be to maintain that level of um organicness so so i love the fact that you're having to um to do this so for a small given that it's a relatively um you know like i've, I've done a little bit of research on this too in, in terms of the community base because it's not huge yet right so even though it's all around the world and the concept is definitely um you know getting momentum how what sort of things when would you recommend that a that a business whether it be a solopreneur or a you know a, a larger business actually start to look at this as a way of doing business as a way of implementing these things into the fabric of what they do as early as possible um I don't know that necessarily like certification, you have to have been in business for a year to certify. Um, but the assessment itself is free and accessible. So, you know, I, I'm working with a buddy who just went out on his own this year. And I'm like, I mean, I know you're not ready. Like he's still, you know, he got his first client this week, you know, like he, he, he knows where he wants to go, but I'm like, start tracking though. Like, you know, he did something for my nonprofit for a discount. And I'm like, make sure you're keeping that either either note it in the, the QuickBooks invoice um, or or keep a, a Google sheet at this point. But just note that you gave me a 
pro bono discount for my nonprofit to make this affordable for us to be able to afford because he came out and recorded an event we had. So I'm like, start thinking about those things, though. Track your your community impact. Um, track your your suppliers. You know, start keeping that spreadsheet of, of, you know, I know everything from, you know, are they female owned? Are they minority owned? Are they local? Are they within 50 miles of our headquarters? Like start thinking about like, okay, all these things, they kind of give you the playbook to be impactful, like to follow the United Nations, all the SDGs. It is the playbook of like, you know, how diverse is our workforce? If you say you care about gender, have you looked at your employee roster right now? I know when we started this, I mean, granted, we were at eight employees. It was definitely the foundation upon which we built the business because that was why they did it. They wanted to build something different. They wanted to build not another consulting company. And, you know, 25, 30 employees when we certified it towards the end, of, I think it was the actually it was after we certified. But like the end of 2019, we were 73, 74 percent white male. And it's mm -hmm. like you say you care. But you're looking at your numbers, you're like, but do we? And then what's the yeah. strategy? Like, and and I think that's the important part of doing it early. It's a lot easier. You're still turning the speedboat, not an ocean, not a you know, a freight liner um, mm -hmm. or a big uh, ocean liner. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the easiest part of doing it early is to start baking that into the company DNA. And I, I wouldn't necessarily say that you have to certify right away because it might not be right, but uh, especially though in the in the beta seaside it's becoming a nice differentiator as gen z generates you know they make disposable income now i heard something on the radio today and the guy was still talking about millennials and his co-host was like dude millennials have like kids and mortgages now like they're, they're not in college that's gen z like and i and i know that like the oldest gen z i think turns 27 next year the oldest millennial turns 41 um yeah, yeah so I think I think the time is it's never a bad time to at least go through the assessment and go like, what? How do I put my money where my mouth is like here is here is literally a cheat sheet and like the weights of the different, you know, the different answers in the in the questions that they're asking of like, you know, like, oh, dang, like, do we have an annual impact report? What do we put in our annual impact report? Like, mm -hmm. never thought about that, but put it on your radar, you know, and maybe this year, like. You know, you have eight customers. You don't need an annual impact report yet, but you can start thinking kind of strategically of like, where are we going to be in two, three, four years? And how do I make these a how do I start tracking these KPIs and b how do mm -hmm. I put strategies around just as I would like revenue? So as I'm doing long term strategic planning that I'm I'm planning to hire a diverse workforce. I'm not just talking about it. and then you wake up because most startups you hire your friends and your cousin and you, all the people you probably shouldn't be hiring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then you wake up and it's, you know, 30 people that look like you. Yeah. Yeah. So so for again, just to, to help everybody understand, you know, what why would somebody want to do this? Like, what is the impact from a business perspective? You know, from a point of view, because when we buy, when we start out in business, you know, generally speaking, there's going to be a maybe three things that are going to happen. One, you're building your business to hang on to it forever. It's going to be your your income. Second will be, you know, you're creating it as a legacy to be able to hand it down to someone else. The third being, oh, we want to grow this up so that we can actually sell it. So in in either of those three cases, or in all of those three cases, like what are what are some of the major benefits that you're seeing? Uh, for businesses that actually go down this route? A lot of it is, and it's funny, I teach a B Corp class and I used to shy away from doing like ROI analyses, um, but I have MBA students. So I'm like, do an ROI analysis for this owner. Like, let's do one. And But I also brought them back to what's his goal? What is his goal with this uh -huh. company? Is it eight employees? And, and, you know, they're a risk management company. I'm like, is it eight employees forever? Or do they want to be 150 employees? And the answer was, no, he really wants to scale this thing. And I said, okay, so who's he going to hire? And they're like, well, I think he's, he's looking at hiring people right out of college. I'm like, okay, so Gen Z. Okay. So pull some demographics on what Gen, Gen Z cares about. Find me one that says they care about money, like overwhelmingly over purpose. Oh, they care about money. They want to make a livelihood. They want a job they care about. So I think there's an aspect of that in there that is 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 a compelling argument, both from the consumer side and the employee side. Um, I wrote a piece 
six months ago or nah, I was no, I did. It was right after my lecture on Milton Friedman. So how many times can I mention Milton Friedman tonight? Uh, that's three. Um, so but I wrote it on at the end of his Friedman doctrine. He says something about the, like, you know, the consumer and the employee will be the death blow of this social, you know, consciousness, mm -hmm. conscious capitalism. And then he was right. Unfortunately, he went that they went in the other direction. It was kind of the end of like shareholder primacy that they don't care about making as much money as possible. They don't care about buying the cheapest product available. They care about people that do business the right way. And that's who they want to work for. And I think especially in the last 12, 18 months, you've seen this come like full circle with COVID and, and kind of the great, whatever you want to call it, racial awakening, where it was like, okay, what are we actually doing to solve this problem upstream as opposed to just being like, mm -hmm. well, I thought I was a good person. So I think the commitment is there now. And then I will also add on top of that, because of that, everybody's doing it. And yeah. not everybody's yeah. doing it for the right reasons. For reasons. So mm -hmm. I think the B Corp thing, and I always do this, it's the bundle that brings all your good together. So I think that that certification is a way to kind of signal to the marketplace that like, yeah, we're legit. Like we, like it's a tedious product. Like it took us two years to get there. Um, mm -hmm. The bigger the company, kind of the longer it takes. And that wasn't with like waiting for our audit. That was literally just the amount of work. Like we didn't have a handbook. Well, of course we wrote one. Then you realize like later, you're like, you can Google that. And there's handbooks on the internet, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. there's a lawyer that probably has a template that they can draft one for you in about two hours of, of build work. So um, I think that's a big thing. It's just a big differentiator. And I think so even more in the B2C space, I, I can't make an ROI argument for us. We do Salesforce implementations. So if somebody buys Salesforce, mm -hmm. we come in and whatever. Well, we don't touch wires. We we have really smart people. They don't let me touch the technology. Um, but I don't know that anybody's buying from us because like, ooh, they're a B Corp. They're like, are they really, can, you know, can they get us the max return on our investment in the Salesforce technology? And can they make it work? And can they understand our business needs? I will say we've hired people. I've seen you know, I do a survey for new hires and like, hey, why did you work for us? Like, why did you sign your offer letter? And you see a lot of the ones we hire pretty aggressively out of undergraduate programs. And it's the, you see that in their answer, B Corp. I just thought it was different. I thought it was really cool. Love that you were a B Corp, things like that. So on the recruitment side, it's helped us. Um, on the business development side, I, I don't know that it has. But on the B2C side, I think there is a definite... Um, there is a definite ability to get that. Um, I don't want to say disposable income. It sounds like you're this greedy, like get their disposable mm -hmm. income. But I think to attract customers, like I know when I shop, you know, what did I buy this year? Like for Christmas, it's Tom shoes. It's a Patagonia. She's in the other room. Um, it's, Athleta, like it's, it's, I bought from B Corps because I know, and they might not be perfect. I don't think any company's ever perfect, but I know they're on that journey and they put in a lot of work mm -hmm. to be a really good company. So and I suppose that that's the, the answer to this question, isn't it? That sometimes there isn't always a direct ROI from a financial aspect, but in some, somewhere it always does come back to the finance, the finances at some point, because if you're thinking about, you know, okay, well, why did my employee, why do employees want to join us? Because they've said, hey, you guys are pretty cool. I see you're on the B Corp. That that must mean something. That must mean that you're, you know, you're doing good. Um, I want to work for a company that's doing good. Therefore, you know, easier to potentially attract a, a new employee, particularly those, um, the Gen Zs, which I'll get to in a moment. And then the, the second part being, you know, retention, uh, you know, as you say, that B2C being to consumer, you saying, well, hey, I'm prepared to support a company that has actually got a business that's doing good in the world. So there might not necessarily be a direct uh, correlation to the, to the, to financial ROI, but there is from a, you know, maybe it's an intangible from a, a social um, responsibility point of view, employee satisfaction, and a whole raft of other things that I would imagine would come with just being darn good people, you know, and when you, when you come at things from that point of view, people want to work for you, people want to buy your stuff, and they're likely to come back again and again and again. So that's kind of, um, you know, what I would see as the, as the, 
as some major benefits in being, uh, you know, associated with a B Corp. I mean, you could rattle, you rattled off all of the different names of all the different companies that are in, you know, that are in that B Corp space, and you were prepared to go and buy from them simply because they were, um, they were so, which is which is great. The other thing that I think is you mentioned about, um, you know. In, particularly from an employee stand um, standpoint that you know lots of people are not always driven these days by the almighty dollar they're not always worried about well, how much are you going to pay me it may have been the case some years ago but um I, i've been reading some studies fairly recently about you know the 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 number of employees who are actually leaving permanent employment now particularly because of the whole covid situation I'm, and i'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on this too but we're seeing this um mass exodus out of uh, the nine to five job because people don't want to be you know they've realized that hey i've had a little bit of a taste of this working from home i've had a little bit of a taste of you know um this this flexible environment um you know and maybe where i am right now with you know the pandemic and uh, so forth has actually brought a lot of people to that kind of almost to that that edge of the cliff thinking is this really what i want or do i want to be doing something quite different and and most people that I've been talking to are, are, are shifting their thoughts from "I want to earn a whole lot of money" to actually "I want to do something that I'm that I'm really passionate about, that has some meaning and purpose to it, that does good in this world." So I think um, you know the whole B Corp, uh, uh, what would we call it, momentum, and um, it, it is is really well positioned for where people's mindsets are at right now. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I mean, yeah, the great resignation is real. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I can't wait to study this in, in 10 years, you know, to just to, to, to see all the quality, the, the quantitative and qualitative research that comes out of this. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's this big push where people tasted freedom, if you will. Like I've had those, the chair watching jobs where, you know, you've got the flu and you have the ability to work from home. The Internet worked in 2011. I worked from the road when I was, you know, this is when I was in sales. But, yeah, I was back in town. And so, like, you have to be in the office with the flu, with your suit on. Like, why? And and none of that made any sense to me. And I and I never really understood it. It was like because. And it's interesting. And, and you know, earlier this year. I actually, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with our CEO about something and, and I could tell there was a little bit of a, well, you know, when I came up and I'm like, I know, but like, just because you had a terrible first job experience doesn't mean everybody wants one then they're not going to put up with it. And so I ran our company demographics and showed them to him and, and, and like you could see the jaw drop. And, and the one thing I'll say for him is he's probably the most receptive person to feedback and that the true transparency and candor is our first value, but was like, oh, 37 percent of our company is under the age of 26 or younger. So 36 Gen Z or th excuse me, 37 percent. And then 79 percent of our company is under the age of 40. So millennials and Gen, that's it. And so like you have our executive team over here and then you have a bunch of 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 whatever you want to call them, young bucks that are, are, you know, and Gen Z, bless their heart, that like millennials, we were kind of afraid, I think a little bit. We were kind of still had our parents in our ear that were like, you just, you get your job and you're happy with it. Mm -hmm. You kind of, you just deal and you'll be fine. Um, keep your head down. And so sometimes they're just going to, you're going to have to do things you don't like. And Gen Z is like, uh-uh, no, no, we're not doing it. I saw my parents get laid off in 2008 to working mm -hmm. somewhere for 20 years. Like, no. And then millennials kind of got behind the Gen Zs and we're like, oh, are they starting the rebellion? Because like we're in like we just we were too coward to do it on our own. And so I think you're seeing companies kind of react to that of like the like the nine to five. And maybe I'm just I have blinders on because I work for one of these companies where like he had to break me of the habit of like he'd be like, hey, I'm an hour and a half from the office. I went in today. I, I go in maybe once a week, maybe pro probably like once every two weeks. Um, just because I like to see people, but 
he had to break me of the habit of of he would hit me up on Slack and go like, "Hey, are you coming in this week?" And I'd be like, "Well, I was going to, but you know," I, and he's like, "Dude, I don't care. I'm just asking if you're coming in." Like, yeah. but I was so prepared to have like an excuse ready as to why I wasn't in the office, and assuming he's questioning like my loyalty or if I'm actually working, and he's like, "Dude, I don't care. Like, just I, I'd actually just like to see you." Yeah. I'm just asking the question. Even mm-hmm. today, I saw him. We talked about the football game on Saturday for five minutes. And then I was there for like two hours. I had to run some errands and do some things in town for, for us. I mean, it was like a charity drop off, but it was just like, yeah. And I think companies are adapting to that. And honestly, the, the, the other shoe that is dropping right now, I think is a component of this is that not everybody is meant to love remote work. I'm a Mm. very, very, very strong extrovert. And it took me a long time to get used to working from home all the time. Um, not seeing my boss, even even the the like the praise aspect of not getting the like that little like attaboy when you're like in the kitchen. Yeah. And he's like, hey, great job on that report. He has to now remember to like go and it's like great job on the report. Like, so like I had a really good mentor taught me, like, give yourself your own praise. That was my 2021 New Year's resolution was to get better at that. And I am. Um, but, I've, I've you know, I think a lot of people are trying to recreate this remote work environment that resembles mm. an office environment and it's it's not it's not mm-hmm. it doesn't it never will there's no silver bullet and so i think leaning into that and having that conversation with hey it's going to be remote but hey here's how it's different and i mm-hmm. so i think there's a there's you're starting to see people kind of realize that if, of like hey we've had some employees that were in the office all the time and then covid remote and then they decided to move and and I, I I can sense they're struggling, you know, being like not yeah. seeing their cohort. And it's like, you know, like I think it was the right decision for your life. But if you need an office, I would say go get a job where you can go back in an mm-hmm. office. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's a loaded, it's a loaded question right now. I mean, I've seen what is it, Facebook or Meta or whatever they're called now. Um, yeah, yeah. They had a job posting they remote employee director of remote employee engagement. And I'm like, how? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. How are you going to do that? So. I mean, it's an it's a very very interesting landscape that we're in right now, right? With this whole almost like re-engineering um, of the entire workforce and what this what things are going to look like. And to your point of, you know, okay, well, we, let's do some studies on this and see what's actually going to happen. You know, with the great resignation, many many people resigning. But we also know on the flip side of things, you know, everyone's all gung ho. Hey, let's go and start a business. But we also know that very few businesses actually survive. So you know that those that are out there right now, particularly if they're watching, um, you know, today's show, if you got some business skill and you you know you you know your stuff and you're a, you're a good teacher then there's going to be a load of people out there wanting your mentorship and your help to actually get them to the point where they can actually thrive in a business because it's quite like to your point of it's a very different beast going from working in an office to now I'm going to turn my, take my office and just plonk it in my home and expect that it's going to operate in the same way it it, it doesn't it takes some you know it takes some time you've probably I think you you were mentioning, you know, you, it took a little while for you to get used to that. It certainly did me being, you know, someone who enjoys being around people too, to all of a sudden, oh, where is, I don't even have a dog. You know, I don't even have that person to, a, a, an animal to talk to. You know, so you you are on your own in that, um, in that case. But then also, you know, taking the leap out of being an employee now into being a an employer of oneself, potentially an employer of other people and running your own business, quite a different, you know, a, quite a different beast again. So I think there's some um, some massive opportunities that are out there right now. For those people that um, obviously are loving what you're talking about today in terms of becoming a B Corp and, and I know that there's a process that you go through and the the answer to you know when should I get started well you know no time like the present you can get started now it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and get yourself certified no it doesn't but if you have a, an interest in this and you you're you know you're serious about implementing it can they just go and get the um this like the the checklist or you know that you're talking about and just start implementing some things until such time as they're at a point where they're ready to actually apply um you know through the through the process, you know, through the correct process. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Like anybody can create an account and, and log in. I think it's bimpactassessment.net. 
and you go in, create in like, you, yeah, and you can answer. And, and honestly, there's, I forget, I forget the number of versions of this thing that there are. I think there's like with all the different like permutations, cause it's, it's, you know, as you answer a question, it will unlock other questions. So if you say like, what demographics do you track? Uh, none. Okay. Well, those next three questions don't open up, but okay. What percentage of your workforce is female? What percentage of your workforce is underrepresented minority? What percentage of your workforce is under 24, over 55? Like those three questions are hidden unless you answer yes, we track employee demographics. So you can go through and play with it and honestly just give yourself a score. Like I, there, there's, and it's funny because every company, and again, I teach, so I teach a class at UGA and I've been working with these students. They finally hired me part time to actually teach the class, but I've probably done 25 to 30 of these. And um, it's funny to see the look on the face of the of the client when they're like, oh, a 40. You know, they, they thought they were like the greatest company in the world. And you're like, uh, I mean, and I tell them, I'm like, we were for everybody. Like, that's where the work starts. OK, so like you weren't as great as you thought you were. Like I've, I've seen, I think in the in like four years of doing these projects out of the, you know, the 30 or so we've worked on one until this semester we're going to get two across the finish line this semester where they're actually going to be at the needed 80 points mm-hmm. so that'll put us at three so 10 yeah, wow. companies we've worked with have actually in one semester gotten to 80 which means they were probably pretty good to start with um but I mean, we've worked with some killer brands in georgia that you know we're doing a ton of good and they're like all right so we did it we finished it we're at a 42 and you're like don't feel bad about it. I think there's a little bit of a, like a shame, but it's like, okay, now let's look at like, where could, where could we get more points? Like, and again, you're just trying to see like what, and honestly, for well, somebody. What's your starting point, right? So you're just yeah. trying to get, well, where are you at right now? Where are we starting from and, and create yourself, you know, some benchmarks from there. And you could even, you could even chunk it off and say that like, Hey, I'm really passionate about, our environmental impact and our supply chain and where we're sourcing from and how we're, so just focus on the environmental section, just try to improve that. Or, Hey, you know, I've got three employees right now and I know by the end of next year, if my strategic plan pans out the way I've envisioned it, we're going to have 10. Like, so maybe focus on the worker section of like, what are the things that I should be focusing on? What needs to go into the handbook? Like, what do we, even the, like, you know, he laughed all the time about like back in the day, mm-hmm. like we put a lactation break policy in the handbook. Not that we would have mm-hmm. ever said no, but w- you start thinking about though, a new hire comes in, what's their first impression? If they're, you know, especially when you're hiring, you know, somebody in their mid twenties, maybe they want to have kids like, oh, wow, there's no parental leave policy. There's no lactation break policy. Like, even though we would have said yes, like, go ahead and put that stuff in there. So starting to think about like all those things and, um, depending on what you're, you're focused on, you know, or you already have 10 employees, maybe now you want to focus on the governance. Like, what are we sharing with our employees? How transparent are we? Do we need them? You know, we share regularly, we share revenue, we share expenses. Like, here's what goes into payroll. Here's what goes into your benefits. Like, we're not just like swimming, like, you know, Scrooge McDuck and piles of gold coins. Like this is, this is the margin, you know, and this is where you mm-hmm. can impact the margin. So I, you know, I think it depends on what you're focused on, or maybe it's just customers. Maybe you just want to be a very ethical online, you know, B2B plat- or B2C f- platform and like, hey, let's focus on our, what is our data governance policy? Do we have a data governance policy? So I mm-hmm. think going through it and starting to, it'll help you think about things. And then I always say too, like, you can't improve what you're not measuring. So like, if you say you yeah. care about something, put a number to it. And then Mm -hmm. set yourself a goal and just see what you can do. Like, and if you set a, if you have, if you get your number, you have your current state and then you say, okay. And especially on this one, it brackets, you know, there's like five different, whatever thresholds. I I just want to move up to the next one next year over 2022. Let's get to that next threshold of, you know, whatever, completely satisfied customers or whatever. And like, okay, now I've quantified it. What's my strategy around it? Cause now you can set a goal and figure out how does this bake into our, you know, our overall strategy for the company next year. And I think that is an incredibly powerful exercise. I think a lot of people get lost in the, I don't even know where to start. And I think this is probably one of the best places to start for a purpose-driven entrepreneur. Well, that's fantastic. Look, let me make sure that I get, um, I want to make sure that everybody gets that website. Let's, um, so it was B impact. Assessment. Assessment? Dot, yeah. Dot net. I'm 99.9% sure. 
dot net. All right. We I go to it so much that it's space, so, but I was gonna say I go to it so much that it just autofills. So I'm like, and answer. <laughs> So All right, well, let's just pop that up on the screen. There you go, guys. So if you're listening to the podcast right now, it's B uh, for Bob, impactassessment.net. If you head on over there, you should be able to get your hands on uh, that assessment. And if we've got that incorrect, we'll make sure that we correct it in the show, show notes and description uh, for today anyway. But I think that's fantastic advice. Like, just go over there, get you know, do the assessment, get yourself a bit of a, 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 a starting point. And even I think, it, as you say, it will just allow to stimulate some more thought, allow you to think about various different things. Like you're just saying, you know, having a, um, a lax action policy inside of uh, inside of your your employee handbooks. Most people wouldn't even think about that, but you've just taken off the table the need for a, a, a young woman to even ask. You know, it's, there's no need for the conversation to even be had because it's right there in black and white. It's possible you can do it. We support you. So, you know, I love the fact that this is um, this is going to stimulate some more conversation. And I think it's important for you to do this, even if you are, a, you know, you're a one woman, one man band right now, because you're not always going to be. You might be that right now, but, you know, in a year's time, you'll have maybe two or three employees and then six or seven, just like um, Nathan's saying with his company, you know, you move to eight, then you're at 23, and before you know it, you're up around 80, which is a decent-sized business. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the earlier you can start doing this sort of stuff, the better. I absolutely love this um, this whole concept and the movement that is being created around uh, the whole, you know, B Corp um, side of things and the social impact and the very holistic, uh, you know, point of view that you guys, that, that the whole system has, that you're looking at it from, you know, a holistic um, perspective. So before we round out today's show, is there anything else that, like, when you're thinking back over whether it's your career, whether it's, um, you know, the things that you've learned through, uh, through the B Corp side of things, there's a piece of advice that you could give to another business owner. What would that one piece of advice be? I'm putting you on the spot a bit here, Nathan. Cool. I know that. But, but what would be a question. piece of advice you would give? Um, it's okay to not be perfect. Um, and I think in this day and age too, especially, I don't want to call it whatever, cancel, quote, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Like, uh, you're never going to please everybody. Um, and, and, and you, you, you're probably going to get called out for something at some point, but I, I think like, to me, it's a journey and it's not my place to judge where you're at on the journey. I think it's my place to help you along the journey. So like, don't be afraid to start anywhere. Like I always use the analogy and then I'll, I'll even show like, so to say my usual analogy is if you're going to drive 500, we'll, we'll use kilometers tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. But if you're going to drive 500 kilometers, like you got to drive the first five and then 10 and then 15. So like, I think, and I, and I, and I think this is just in, in general with a lot of problems society faces, we get so overwhelmed by it or like, you know, litter or, you know, uh, whatever. It's just like, it, like you're, you're paralyzed with how daunting the problem is. And it's like, well, just go pick up some trash, start. Like start doing something. Like I even got T-shirts made last year where I was like, "This is gonna be my new motto: Take action, make progress." Like just go do. Like what he says, just go do it. Just start somewhere. Do one thing. Do another. Mm -hmm. Do a third thing, and like kind of make that a habit. And I think with with purpose driven entrepreneurs, and I think some I think most people nowadays want to be doing more and want to be doing better. I just think a lot of people are afraid to start, but they they and you're going to wake up in 10 years and you're, you're nowhere near kilometer 500. You're still at the starting line because you were trying to look for like, okay, how do I get to 500? And you're like, uh, I drive. I just yeah. Yeah. Take one step. Yeah. Just do one thing. So, so I want to, I want to um, actually give everybody a bit of a, I suppose a call to action today, which is based on what Nathan has been talking about today. And I love that um, that saying, you know, take action and make progress. The whole premise of, you know, living your life unlocked or creating an, a, 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 an online business with, 
you know, through the Unlock show is to actually take some action and make some progress every single week. So what I want to ask you now as a listener of t- on today's show is what's one action that you could take today that will move you one step closer? And it doesn't even matter if that step is one teeny weeny little step or it could be a leap. Whatever that may be, what is one thing that you could do today? And if you're listening uh, on the podcast or you're listening to the live show, just type that into uh, into the uh, the comments section and let us know what is it that you're going to do. Could be something as simple as heading on over to uh, beimpactassessment.net and actually starting the process of doing the assessment so you know where you're at. It could be that you're going to review, you know, um, you know, your own values. It could be, are you make it, you know, reevaluating? Are you on doing things on purpose? Are you being intentional with your time? It could be anything, but just some form of action to make some form of progress today. So I want to say thank you so much to Nathan. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I've loved, um, I love the concept. I love the um, the movement that he is involved in. And I want to let everybody know if uh, they want more of Nathan or, you know, they want to have more of a conversation with you. Have I got this right, Nathan? So they can head on over to LinkedIn. Nathan is stuck. Uh, you can connect with Nathan there. And I'm sure that he would be happy to uh, continue this conversation further and give you any more information you need about uh, becoming a B Corp. But thank you very much for being here. It's been a pleasure to have you on the Unlock Show. And I hope that we can have you back sometime uh, in the near future too. Always happy to come on and talk B Corps. Thanks for having me, Tracy. You're very welcome. All right, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. As per normal, I'm going to see you guys again for another uh, episode of The Unlock Show next Wednesday, Australian Eastern Standard Time at 10 a.m. Bye for now.